Thanks for having me. You can jump right in the hot seat so sure. we don't miss a moment of our time with you. Absolutely. Craig Bolio, Deputy Tax Commissioner. Do you want anything on the screen? Nope, I'm good. Thanks for having me. I understand the central question of uh, what I was looking to talk about here is uh, what, what reaction I may have if uh, medical dispensaries were to start selling recreational marijuana ahead of wide retail sales. Is that correct? That's, that's what we're contemplating. Okay. Um, so from the tax department's perspective, um, I would always ask for 12 months between when something was legalized to actually set up the infrastructure within our department, both the policy infrastructure and the IT infrastructure to start collecting that tax. Um, so I'd be looking for about that time frame from, from when something passed before it ever, um, before we had to actually start taking money in the door. And um, again, that's, that's uh, contingent on us being able to mandate um, electronic payment. Um, if we couldn't do that, it's a bigger discussion of how to um, how to outfit our building to be capable of taking cash. Um, in terms of, of revenue, uh, certainly that would provide some uh, faster revenue with fees that uh, those dispensaries may uh, pay as well as potentially having uh, earlier tax revenue. Um, in terms of numbers though, I really want to work as part of the uh, Governor's Marijuana Advisory Commission, uh, the tax department uh, analysts worked with a joint fiscal office um, to come up with a consensus estimate. I'd really love to go back and, and work with them. Um, I think there's a few questions that we would need to know uh, to figure out what that would do from the revenue uh, perspective. Um, certainly what, what the rate is going to be and what the uh, effective date of retail sales would be, but I think the bigger sort of uh, question to, that we would have to answer is what share of the market that was originally envisioned for a legalized cannabis market could be met by uh, the medical dispensaries until wider uh, retail sales were allowed, which is a question we can't answer, but just uh, we need some time to do that. Hmm. Questions? Maxwell? <laughs> <laughs> it's going to take a while. <laughs> Sorry, yes. Max for sure. Yes, Jim. <laughs> uh, you said mandating electronic. Yeah. That might be problematic in this area. Um, yeah, certainly I can understand the challenge. I'm not an expert in that area. Uh, my understanding was. Which could be. Um, well, not in terms of the banking regulatory structure uh, that exists. Okay. Um, but my understanding is so. So I spoke with uh, Senate Finance on that very topic and had encouraged them to speak with uh, both Department of Financial Regulation and uh, just banks and credit unions. Um, after those discussions, it was in the bill that we were able to do that. So I was assuming that, that those were fruitful discussions for them. Um, it can be a challenge, but my understanding is that the medical dispensaries are currently serviced by a credit union here for depository accounts. Um, and in Massachusetts, I have heard, but again, I'm no expert and don't have my own facts, yeah. that they have all been able to acquire depository accounts. So if we were talking about giving them the option to pay cash. Yeah, that'd be very difficult for us. Um, we don't have the security infrastructure to take large sums of cash. We don't take large sums of cash from the dispensaries now. Um, they are paying our payroll our withholding. Nope, right. no. no. and it would be, it would be expensive and, and, and take a lot of time to set up. Um, and we'd have to hire additional staff to, you know, count it, guard it. Um, so we really just don't want to be in the business of that at all. JP, would you accept uh, bank orders? Um, yeah, people to, uh, eventually take their cash to their bank and get a certified check. You know? Yeah, I, the I, I, I feel like, like that. I don't know what logistical challenges that would present for the business, but I feel like that may be more difficult than bringing it to us because the bank is going to, I think they have their own requirements if you were to come in with cash deposits over, I think, 10 grand. But yeah, they've got to report them to the bank yeah. automatically anyway. But yeah, which I think is what would lead them to a lot of their the banking problems that they're having, yeah. is whether or not the bank is willing to take that money. Or, or that might present problems. Or, yeah, I see what you mean. Bob? So it's <clears throat> cash, something you could farm out? Um, it's possible. Uh, <laughs> we explored it a little bit as part of the, um, uh, the commission, but I did not have a lot of success on that. 
it, it exists in terms of it, it exists in some areas I didn't find like ideally we just would not have to be involved at all right someone could set up what would essentially be a mobile bank or something like that uh, which was not a service that I found readily available there are certain things like we could set up um, you know vaults in the lobby or something like that but you still need additional security in our building to be able to do that you need guards for transport you need a lot of uh, infrastructure that we don't have so ultimately, I think it's some combination of having to, you know, contract with somebody to do a, a large share of this would be on the table. The cash transportation guard of all those people, do they provide any of that type of service? They provide some of, of it for sure. Storage, accounting. Yeah, I would assume level. they have to. Um, again, I haven't looked deeply into this yet, but um, what I was hoping for was to basically have uh, you know, an armored car service be willing to take the money directly, um, and I haven't yet had success in that. Last Christmas, I won. <laughs> Rob, um, is there any any other, I guess, um, do you have a relationship with any other company or whatever that there's an excise tax? That's collected as opposed to you know straight up sales tax or rooms and meals, it, or because when I fill out my tax form, there's the you know sales and use and then uh, local option. But is there anything else that we would collect a tax on that's considered an excise tax? No, really, this is sort of a, an interesting uh, naming issue as well. It's you know excise tax is often based on weight, but this is really, it's really a sales tax, right? And we, we didn't call it a sales tax, too. we didn't want to confuse it with the other sales tax, but um, yeah, I, I would look at it more of, as like a sales tax, a standard sales tax. Would you anticipate it being collected roughly the same way, in other words, being done online based off of gross sales? And um, I, I think that depends on what the, the ultimate law becomes, but um, if it's based on gross sales, yeah, we would probably structure it very similarly to how we do the sales tax. Okay, thank you. Jim. Mm -hmm. Am I allowed to ask task related questions to the commission? Deputy. Deputy. No, yes. no, no, no. <laughs> the, the, the cannabis commission. The study group, the governor's council. Uh, oh, yeah. Okay. How did you come up with 26%? So, there were a lot of factors that went into that. One was trying to be um, competitive with any remaining underground market. One was trying to be competitive with other states and jurisdictions. And the third was to um, make sure that there would be enough uh, money generated by the revenue estimates to cover uh, the health and safety uh, requirements that the, the other two uh, subcommittees had laid out. And what do other states charge? About it's all over the map. Um, Washington, I think, is the highest at like 37% maybe. Um, and there are some states that are down in the 10% range. Um, it's all, it's in the, we have a, a comparative chart. Maybe I brought it with me. Uh, yeah, so there's a comparative chart in the report um, that lays it out. Some of them are, like Massachusetts, I think there's like three different taxes. So I don't know what the ultimate rate is. It's pretty close. It's maybe in the 15 to 20% range, but I don't know exactly. But it's based on, you know, some of them have combo of weight and sales. Some of them have just sales. I think it, maybe Alaska has just weight. And does anyone do in between tax uh, at the different tiers? There, there was a suggestion brought out yesterday about a local option wholesaler tax. Or, I or think grower some tax. do, but I don't know off the top of my head who does that. I think that's, well, I don't want to misspeak. Some do, I think. Okay, thank you. So there are five dispensaries. Okay. In your assessment that you would need 12 months, mm -hmm. I assume that in order to collect from just these five, you would go ahead and build the whole system? Yeah, oh, without a doubt. I mean, unless you were saying that those five would only ever be the only ones to sell, but. Um, no, but for the first, you know, if we contemplate the, the dispensaries first, it would be a, a year of sales um, with only five uh, entities who would need to submit. 
Yeah, I mean, for us, it's not necessarily a linear relationship with the volume that we're going to get. It's a relationship with how complicated the infrastructure is, right? Um, and to make sure that we set it up so that it would be scalable uh, when more volume did come into play. I, I would, it would be a challenge for us to try to set up maybe a, a skeleton or a shell of it um, to expand on it later. I'd rather just do it the first time and, and be all set with it. So we have floor in a few minutes, and then we will come back right after the floor and continue working through uh, any of the remaining decision points that we want to give direction to Legislative Council to draft over the weekend. So has everybody uh, had a chance to think about what they'd like to, to see in the bill? Jim, you were working on a side project. Have you so, narrowed that down? On the rulemaking, um, I've met with a couple of people this morning. I've talked to Ledge Council. Um, I'm not sure if it's ready for prime time or it might complicate things, but I need to have another conversation to see if we could make some simpler change that won't upset too many um, okay. apples on the education issue that you asked us to give some thought about. We have thrown out a proposal. Um, I haven't fleshed it all off. This was a 2 a.m. wake up, you know, thinking about it. Um, 2 a.m. Um, Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> um, so it, it may need some uh, other, you know, people can take it for what it's worth. Um, but my concern is that we start from zero for this fund for education and prevention and it's like you got to wait a year to know even what you have in there based on the tax receipts because um, it's tied to that uh, and I guess I would throw out um, I don't think we'd be taking too much of a gamble but what if we set a floor um, and I know this is an appropriation for the future, but a floor of say a million and a half dollars so that you knew you could do a certain basic amount concurrently with, if not before, um, the commercial market started and then <coughs> tie it to the 30% up until a certain amount. And I don't know whether that's six million, seven million. I do worry about going too far, even though there's arguably the bigger the market is, the more you need for education and prevention. But I, I, I don't want uh, this fund to become addicted to the money either um, and have sort of a perverse relationship with, great, keep selling because we get more money uh, wow. for I mean, our programs. And there's I don't morality questions with what we do with our lottery revenue as well, but I don't sure. think anybody suggests that we're right. bilking people. But, but, the, but the, lottery, the, the lottery is such a small part of the overall ed fund. promoting lottery to yeah. lower our property taxes to any real extent because it's a, it's a small amount of money. Yeah. So that's just, yeah. that was my 2 a.m. So thought. a floor. All right. Um, Mike and then Bob. Sure. We're not starting from zero here. There are up and running prevention coalitions all around the state. What we're trying to do is enhance what they're doing already. Yeah. So. Um, Waiting till the coffers are populated for the augmented fund. You know, I don't see a problem with that. I mean, we have a good read, but you know, I, I hope. And if we need more information, I can. Uh, yeah, we can get that. In. But the information, the systems are out there already. We're not trying to start from scratch. Yeah, appreciate that. Bob. 
When I said a week ago that I didn't think we should let the bill out of here without our signature on prevention and education, I thought the response that I got from you was measured. And I want to thank you for coming back with such an assertive and noteworthy proposal. Good job. So this is not related to what should go into the bill, but it's related to the bill. Um, I was at breakfast this morning with two esteemed members from our committee. Uh, and we were talking. Did they make you pay? <laughs> <laughs> well, not yet. But uh, it, it occurred to us, we're having all this conversation and assumptions about the illicit market that we haven't heard from. So what would that look like to, to get some, whether it's through a proxy or however, but just to get a better sense of testing our assumptions? But I think that's important to discuss and to weigh in terms of how we structure this thing. You know, what's what's their appetite for for the fees and so forth. So my my sense of that just and you know I probably have about this much experience, but my sense of that is that um, there's a lot of theoretical conversations around whether what the direction we're going is valuable or useful. Uh, there's a lot of blustering because uh, honestly the status quo works for a great number of people who are out there growing right now. Um, so we have a weekend coming up. I would welcome you to put the feelers out and see if you can have a conversation with, I, I, I'm sure each and every one of us has illicit growers in our communities. Uh, they may not appreciate their state representative seeking them out, but you know, ask ask around, and maybe there are folks in this room who can help send you in the direction where you could have a cup of coffee with someone and have a conversation. Okay. Well, uh, kind of along the line of what I was maybe trying to talk to John about yesterday, last night. Um, I kind of wonder. When I've been involved in activities completely and totally legal in the past, I've always known that there were people that operated on the fringe, whether it's auto racing or other things. I wonder if there's any information that the people that are actually engaged in growing and dispensing now might have on what they believe is the potential market of small growers that they might bring in if they were afforded a, an opportunity to put an umbrella over them with their license in the future for something, whether that's a plausible step up to get production going. Could you elaborate a little bit more about your no. experience? Because I just mm -hmm. want to understand more where you're coming from. When you show the car, I'll show you how to drive it. <laughs> <laughs> um, so circling back to prevention money, you know, I think that, uh, you know, welcome the conversation, Maxwell, and um, and I think that, I think it's valuable for us to set a direction and set, uh, you know, set a, an objective, make a clear statement that, that we want there to be uh, revenues that, that are in a dedicated fund. Um, I don't think we should spend a ton of time on it because we could get it all wrapped up with a pretty bow on top and appropriations could decide, oh, that's not going to work. We're going to do it a different way. I, I mean, I think, they will, I think they will follow our lead in terms of the value of uh, setting aside revenue for the prevention programs, but uh, but the way they do it might look totally different than what we, you know, floor, ceiling, percentage, you know, all of that sort of thing. So let's let's figure out what we want at the statement of this policy committee to be, and we'll let the money folks duke it out on what that actually looks like. Does that make sense? Mm -hmm. All right. What else? JP, did you have something you were working on for? Uh, well, I prepared the uh, just a rough very, very rough uh, proposal to draft, whatever you want to call it. I, and I, I actually changed the name from wholesale to uh, 
to uh, produce for retail sales. You can whatever the play on words, but whatever is more appropriate. This is just something that was used based on the local options tax already proposed by in the Senate bill for the retail sale of marijuana. This, so this, this is Craig still is, in here? Excuse me? Is Craig still in here? No. no. That's too bad. So this one is just designed to put a local options tax okay. on, on the cannabis that is specifically cultivated for retail sales. It's got nothing to do with any any um, current uh, product being produced for medical reasons right now. So in this construct, if my town had both a gross grow facility or a dozen small cultivators and we had a retail, then you would anticipate local option revenue coming from both? Well, the, <clears throat> the local option revenue, the intent behind this is for the local option, uh, local option revenue to come from the cultivators of marijuana being grown for retail sale. Now, I think they're in, in, in you know for double taxations, I think. I think in the case of a cultivation facility that also has a retail store and they're owned by the same people, I think that could be uh, something that maybe the local options tax may not or maybe shouldn't apply to that cultivator if that Marijuana they're growing for retail is going right from their facility to their store. You see what I'm saying? Because because there's going to be there's going to be some some I, I'm assuming there's going to be some locations that a cultivator may have a retail store set up at some point somewhere in that same municipality, and there, and there may be others that won't. So the effect of that on the consumer end would be. A cheaper product from an int from a vertically integrated. Mm -hmm. I don't know that it would. I don't know, I, I get a little confused when you say a cheaper product. Well, if you're putting a two percent tax when it leaves the cultivator, and you're putting a two percent tax when it leaves the retail and goes into the consumer's hand, then that's four four percent. Right. But if you're suggesting that if the grower also has a retail license that there not be the right, grower right yeah I, i'm suggesting that if that's the case that that could be a on the consumer a modification a modification to this i didn't put that in there because i didn't really know how to approach it because i wanted to ask you about that but but again it's you know if uh, say xyz corporation has a retail store <laughs> in that same location that same municipality this the local option on on the cultivation maybe could be waived or, or he could be exempted from that because he's going to, he or she, that corporation or whatever, is going to pay the 2% local option anyway, again, to the state, and it goes back to the municipality every, every quarter and you know, things like that. This could be regulated the same way, and of course, the gentleman that was sitting at the end of the, the table, the deputy tax commissioner, yeah. uh, you know, he's already got issues with, with, the, with the general stuff. Mm -hmm. This is just a, you know another another thing. John and uh, then Rob. Having just looked at this quickly, um, the, the, one of the issues that I see with doing it this way is how would a medical dispensary that's also doing adult sales tax at the grow level because they'd be growing for both what the medical is, patient right? as well as the adult user. Um, and they're tax exempt currently. So how do we get around that? They would basically have to have two separate grow facilities almost, or, or they would have to separate their, their product to, in order to put this tax in place. And yeah. that I think would be a big challenge for the dispensaries. Um, that's just 
compliance challenge as yeah. well. Yeah, especially for like Milton. How would Milton do it? I mean, and, and I thought it was the same, it's the same issue. So I don't have an answer to that because I'm not a, I'm not a, a dispensary, but I, I don't know how they would do that. And a lot of the, a lot of the, uh, this, the businesses doing the taxes and everything, the states and paying their fair share type thing and all of terms of water use is um, a lot of it's not not a not an honor system type thing. It's it's not. You now this, from what I saw with the tour, their their product and their inventory and everything was was highly, highly regulated and, and highly, I, I guess the word I'm looking for, accounted for. Mm. Uh, I mean, every plant was accounted for, which, which literally impressed me. So having said that, I would think that somehow that facility would be able to uh, <clears throat> somehow do the same thing with the, with the retail. I don't know how they do it. I'm, I'm not in that business, obviously. Rob and Mike. Um, well, I, I see a couple things going on here. One is, <coughs> is if you have a facility that's that's sort of doing both, um, as far as revenues go, you're better off just to collect the the two percent at the retail end because you're going to be dealing with a higher number in that regard. When we had talked yesterday, my impression was you were trying to get at that if you have just a grow facility and that's it, um, then there'd be some discussion around. Right, and this is what I <coughs> excuse me. This is what I said this morning with with the facility. If they have a retail uh, uh, facility in, in the same municipality, they would pay their two percent local options tax based on the on the sale of the uh, product not on the cultivation. But if they didn't, they didn't. Okay, now let's, let's pick on the Monte Milton. Right. It's, it's a very good facility. In fact, we, we toured that, so we're familiar with that. That facility there does not currently have a retail establishment in the town of Milton. Okay. I have no idea whether the, you know, the town would allow that or not. So that's irrelevant at this point in time. Uh, they don't have a retail, so that facility would pay the local options tax on the additional cultivation of marijuana intended for a retail sale, not on the current cultivation for medical reasons. And again, how they how they break that down, I have no idea. But if, using your scenario there, if the, if the medical marijuana facility that's there got into the retail cannabis end of it, right, they're going to pay the excise tax and the local options tax based on those retail sales. So you're going to capture that money in that regard. But if you if you don't say you have status quo now, where you've just got the medical marijuana facility, but let's say they started their own grow operation to retail, that, that's a different discussion. Right, well, it, the, the it, town would capture the, the, the money either way. If, if we allow this exemption, the, the cultivator who has a retail establishment actually saves 2% because they're not going to be paying taxes because the taxes on the retail is going to come, going to come from the consumer and they're going to be paying that 2%. So, so the facility, again, picking on one in Milton, uh, Champlain Valley Dispensary, if they don't have a retail, they would pay the 2%. If they do have a retail, they wouldn't. But the, but the cultivator is going to pay the 2% if they don't have the store. If they do have the store, they're not going to pay it. it or it, I don't say they're not going to pay it, I'm just saying it's a possible exemption. I, I, I personally think every, every cultivator should pay it. It may be decided that it's too much tax to pay, and again, we don't want to have the tax too high, sure. because we want to try to you know, get people to, to buy the, uh, as I said before, the good, the good stuff versus the illicit crap that's linked to everything that I take you. Mike, very you patient, go Thank ahead. Thank you. you know, Madam Chair, I appreciate the work that's gone into us. This is not our domain. It's not our domain to take on human services, transportation, ways and means, and all the time we're putting into this is not our domain. And uh, at some point, I'm going to call the question and say this is, I'm going to vote not to continue putting time into taxes in this committee. Mm -hmm. Committee discussion on that concept. 
I know that you talked about that on Friday afternoon um, when I wasn't here last week. So, um, right. So, I can explain what we talked about on Friday afternoon. Is I mean we talked about. Um, <coughs> dispensaries obtaining a temporary license and still <coughs> remaining under the Department of Public Safety, um, you know, for you know, approximately a year, which would allow them under that temporary license to um, sell <coughs> to adults um, mm -hmm. who, are, who are not um, medical marijuana patients. Um, and then they would, um, and they would have to pay a $75,000 um, licensing fee to do that, mm -hmm. um, which would go to the Cannabis Control Board um, to help fund that. Um, and um, that's basically the concept. And yeah. then after the, the temporary license thing, and they would move over as S54 currently is drafted to the Cannabis Control Board. Yeah. So there'd be a transfer. Um, some of the questions I know, some of the, the this, this dispensaries are raised is, you know, okay, they're going to, you know, pay this licensing fee, um, they're going to have to ramp up production, there are, are capital investments they have to make, but there's no guarantee of a permanent license, um, and that's still, you know, how we prioritize um, their licensing under the Cannabis Control Board is still um, <laughs> something that hasn't been fully mm -hmm. um, thought out. Okay. Uh, any other considerations on dispensaries first? Jim and Mike? I think we're going to um, need to hear from the Department of Public Service if it's still within that mm -hmm. safety. Safety. You know, you know what I meant. <coughs> Thank you. Thank you, Ken. The other DPS may not know what the hell we're doing. <laughs> <laughs> That's an interesting testimony. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, I feel like it makes sense yeah. to have something ready to go, and it would appear that they would be the best position. So I would, I would agree with. Mm -hmm. It's a way to open the gates. Yeah. <coughs> and I should just add, you know, Michelle took us through the language in um, Sam Young's House Bill, which contemplated mm -hmm. doing this early sales. Okay. And so that's what we worked. We worked through that language. Great. That's why you only got to page 10 or something. <laughs> <laughs> All right. Um, so we have, uh, we have the opportunity to hear from DPS this morning on their uh, perspective on this. So why don't we take a few minutes um, to do that now? Oh, Voila! Okay. <laughs> I know you thought I was from public service. <laughs> Jim, whatever you need, you let me know because I'm gonna I'm gonna get it right here in the chair for you. Okay. Sorry. <laughs> yes. You have to reconsider the name because the other Maxwell was smart. <laughs> <laughs> So for the record, I'm Christopher Herrick, the Deputy Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. <laughs> um, I have heard the construct. And the Department of Public Safety is very concerned and opposed to, I want to be clear, it ha it's not that we're opposed to dispensaries being able to enter the retail market. It's that that portion of it would be under the Department of Public Safety. And it's because the commissioner and I sign off on the permits now and are not interested in violating federal law going forward. And I, I'm going to read from a memo sent to this committee from Representative Tom Stevens with respect to DLC uh, in the long term and doing the governance of this tax and regulate system. We understand that as long as the product is illegal on a federal level, and distribution remains a felony, that we would be putting Vermonters at risk of conspiracy to distribute from the commissioner on down to the truck driver. And that would apply to the commissioner, deputy commissioner of public safety, 
as well as anybody else would be involved. And so we're very, very concerned about that. That's our biggest concern. Yeah. So help me out. Whether it's you signing off on the license or this new cannabis board signing off on the license, in both cases you're state <coughs> officials. We are the Department of Public Safety. Yeah. We would be enforcing distribute any trafficking violation. But wouldn't you have some responsibility in any case? Don't you have some responsibility for medical dispensaries that are in so violation of federal law? Currently, there's a, it's highly regulated, and I'm sure that the folks from the dispensaries would tell you that as well. Um, they, one of the things that they followed um, is a, a strict regimen of regulation. We, you know, we have registration for patients. We have inspections at the sites. Uh, we do fingerprint background checks mm -hmm. on every employee. And I know you discussed not doing that for folks. Oh, well, I'm, you know. <laughs> and so, um, but it took a while to develop the regulations for the medical marijuana program, which we enforce uh, currently. And so this temporary um, fast track that would be put in place before the cannabis board exists, um, I'm not the rulemaking. You're, you're delaying rulemaking till March, I heard last night, because you understand the amount of time it takes to get rules through. So we, we would be very concerned about being put in the position of signing off on these without strong regulation, which clearly won't come into effect until well after March. Rob? Um, I'm very clear that the Department of Public Safety's DPS, and like some others. We did discuss about the background checks, and there was some robust discussion around whether it be just the license holder or mm -hmm. everybody that works in that capacity. Do you have an opinion about that? Yep. We believe that um, anybody working in this, we're concerned about diversion. Um, we're, and I will say um, the finger, fingerprint background, supported background check works with the medical marijuana program. There's very little um, shrinkage or diversion, if you will, and in part because of that. I think going forward it makes sense. We want to make sure that uh, the big concern is that we're going to be putting the, making it more accessible to the people who shouldn't have it, younger children, whatsoever, whatever. And so that's concerning to us as a department. Do you, um, do you have any latitude, as in, you know, somebody has a background check done and there is something there? <laughs> pick something, a, a, a DWI one or two or whatever, yeah. do you have some latitude as to whether or not that they, yeah. in essence, pass? I, I would recommend and that going forward, especially in the retail, and this may be where your leeway would be in the room, is deciding what would be a prohibitor. That's, that's where I, I think that's where the question really is, is, okay, so somebody has a petty larceny conviction. Do, do we care? Um, I think that needs to be um, fleshed out in rulemaking, especially when you're talking about retail. You're talking about huge, potentially huge volumes versus the medical marijuana, which is small and well controlled. Uh, the dispensaries do a good job. They can, they track. We they know where uh, everything is, and so. And I think it was a, a good point somebody made yesterday with respect to the delay. Um, if somebody, if three people end up leaving, we did work with the dispensaries last session and allow for temporary issuance of, uh, you know, they can work temporarily until the background check comes back. Something provisionally? Yes, sir. Thank you. Questions, committee? Maybe it's more for the committee, but it could be for the deputy commissioner, is there a path forward where 
from your perspective that the dispensary you start selling and they immediately become for that part of their business part of the new cannabis board, which will be at the point in some structure. Does that give you comfort? Help you sleep at night? That probably won't help my insomnia. Um, so the issue that I <coughs> would point out is cannabis board was up and running and they were issuing the permits. That would be one aspect that public safety would be concerned about. But in a general sense, I'm not sure that you have established the rules and regulations that would oversee the program that, that would be in place by October. I think that's the time frame that I saw in 196. And so this oversight board, what standard would they be enforcing to? And without that in place, I'm not sure you can enforce much. Okay. Did I answer your question? Well, I mean, we could, I, I, we could, we could add a provision on emergency rule for that mm -hmm. um, to expedite that, to have that in place. Just whatever. Things just pop out once. Any other questions? All right, stick around because I suspect we'll be talking about this for a few minutes. Well, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you. So, <coughs> Michelle, if you can join us, that would be helpful. Um, I had asked John, I think probably before you walked in, to sort of set the stage since this sure. was a conversation that evolved um, last week when I wasn't here in the afternoon. Um, so if there's anything else that you can do for context to uh, help move this along and uh, and if you have any recommendations on it. Sure. Um, so for the record, Michelle Child's Office of Legislative Counsel. And um, uh, so yes, I think the, the, con the concept is, is taken from H196, <coughs> the idea that you would take the existing dispensaries that are currently regulated under DPS and you would allow them the opportunity to pay a substantial fee for a temporary license to do adult sales and that during that period where they would do be doing early adult sales, they would continue to be regulated by the Department of Public Safety, <laughs> not the board. They would continue to operate the medical program that they, that they do now, and they would also do the early sales, and that they would essentially be following the current rules as they apply for the medical program with certain exceptions. So there are a few that are in the language for H196 saying things like, they're exempted from the, the current plant counts because as we talked about last night, remember it's two times and, and seven times the, the number of patients there is that for purposes of adult sales, those plants <coughs> apply. There's a lot of other things that would be, that you'd want to tweak. Like one of the other things we talked about last week was they would need to be able to have the ability to have a second grow, grow facility. So right now in statute, they're, they're only allowed to have um, like the dispensary is allowed to have two points of service where they see clients and they're allowed to have a separate facility if they want where they can cultivate so you'd want to make sure that they had a separate you know location for being able to cultivate so there's there's little things that you would do and say generally they continue to operate under the medical programs rules with regard to tracking and um, and security the, you know it's the same thing with regard to background checks for all the, the employees they'd still have to have their cards all of those kinds of things would operate so they'd operate under the current regulatory system but just there would be adjustments under that to allow for the for the temporary early sales um, yeah. so who makes those adjustments you guys would specify in the language and say they follow, you know, the there are for the purposes of the temporary license, they are exempted from these provisions. And you go down and say plant counts, you know, then they may have an additional facility. They may do adult sales out of a different location. You know, something that you guys were talking about was, well, would you restrict them to 
the, the locations where they currently serve patients, or maybe maybe those communities are okay with the medical, but they're not okay with the retail, so you would give them the ability to have a separate location, but I think you guys were talking about you only wanted one uh, retail location per like per dispensary so you would you would specify that long list and I as I've been listening to folks through the discussions I've been keeping a, a list of things where you would make the adjustments to make it work so for lack of a better how far down that rabbit hole do we go um, I mean that sounds like a lot of rulemaking to me for instance I think we had a discussion you wouldn't you wouldn't do rulemaking because there's not time what I'm saying is you would they would operate under the current rules that they operate under now as a medical dispensary. As a medical dispensary. Yep. And you would, in session law, in the bill, say for purposes of that temporary permit, you are exempted from these <clears throat> statutory provisions and these things in the rules for purpose of those sales. And so you would, so all the other things around background checks for employees and security and all of those other things that, that, they, that they regulate now, they would still operate under. For, for the, for the uh, sort of, but you know, you're, you're talking about another whole business model, so to speak. And say something, for instance, like I think we'll get talking about the transportation of a product. Mm -hmm. um, and if, I, if I remember correctly, if a, if a dispensary is having some product moved into them, that there's a formula that, that they go through as far as having the number of patients and what they need on, on right. hand, right? Mm -hmm. How would that work and what would it look like for the commercial side? If I'm a medical dispensary and I've got to have additional product moved in, what basis would I use to use for that? Well, like I mentioned, they would have an exemption from the plant counts. Yep. Um, you could decide to put a cap on the amount uh, that they could cultivate for the adult use market, but it's a little hard to know, I think, right now. You know, I think we would are imagining that if you only had five retail sources, there are probably going to be places that are going to have continuous lines seven days a week, and the issue is, you know, how much do you want to allow them to grow during that one year period? Do you want to put a cap on how much they can grow or do you just want it to be based on what they have the ability to raise revenue and be able to do a build out and be able to grow and sell? Um, because it's only going to be five. Um, in terms of transportation and things like that, there's, you know, there's no reason why that can't all still work under the existing regulatory system because you're not, because they're vertically integrated and that wouldn't change at all. You know, the only, you know, the benefit to having the dispensaries be able to go first and do early sales is because they're already really well regulated and they already have a system for doing everything. And so the question is, is can you make little tweaks to it? And like what other states have done, whereas they've said, they're already up and running, let's adjust it a little bit, let them have the first go while we're developing everything else, we can learn from that and then continue to move forward. And then what would happen is that they would, if they want to continue selling, you know, past that, that temporary permit, you know, they would be applying just like everybody else un once the rules are adopted by the board for the new system, if they wanted to have, to be able to do all five things, they would apply for one of each of the new licenses, and then that would be something that would pick up and they would operate under after the temporary license expi expires. Um, something I just wanted to mention on, um, uh, with the with House General's memo to you is, and their concern around the Controlled Substances Act, is that I just want to be clear about the distinction here, is what they were talking about was in response to um, DLL came into House General and was advocating a control model um, like they do for liquor. Um, so, the, so the idea that the state uh, would um, uh, actually warehouse uh, and distribute, warehouse and yeah. distribute yeah. cannabis. Um, and my <clears throat> recommendation to House General is I, I advise them against that because of the Controlled Substances Act and, um, and, um, and the uh, DLL uh, I think Deputy Commissioner you know, said uh, you know, he respectfully disagreed with my assessment, but my, my advice to House General was that I, I saw a distinction I think uh, there's a distinction between being the regulator 
of, of the market and actually possessing the state possessing the cannabis and distributing the cannabis and to me I think that there is a, a, a distinction there and that if you became if the state was actually in possession and having employees you know truck around cannabis and distribute cannabis that 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 takes us um, from probably a, a low on the totem pole in terms of a, if we were a TNR state in terms of in, uh, DO, you know, federal DOJ's uh, enforcement um, priorities and you put us, if we're actually the ones being the distributors of cannabis, I think you put us up there at the top. Um, but DLL disagreed with me on that. And so that's why General was saying, was bringing up the issue around concern around criminality or exposing state employees to um, potentially very uh, stiff penalties at the federal level. Um, right now, you know, as you know, we've been operating a, a medical cannabis registry since 2004, so we've had that for a long time. There's, I think, what, 33 states that have medical registries. Um, there has been um, uh, something called the Rohrbacher uh, uh, Rider on the omnibus spending bill in Congress for the last several years that um, has basically um, prevented DOJ from using any of its of its money to enforce um, to do any kind of enforcement actions against the state to inter that would interfere with their medical cannabis programs and so Congress is basically saying you know you can't take any enforcement that doesn't mean that you know uh, DOJ couldn't come down on any of the states right now who have legal, you know, TNR regulated markets. That's always a possibility. You know, we haven't really, really seen that. But I think there is a distinction between being a regulator and actually kind of participating in, in the market. Right. And what can we learn from the other states as we have? been doing this research, other states have gone with their dispensaries first. Yes. Yep. And under what regulatory regime did the dispensaries expand to adult sales? I think it's varied. I need to take a look of, a little more at that, or maybe I can see if I can get a witness who's got more of a broader scope of, 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 of what's gone on in the other jurisdictions with that, but, um, but that is the majority of, of other jurisdictions have had the, the medical programs, again, go, go first um, because they're up and running and because they're regulated uh, under current. And then what they'll do is they'll tend to, to shift over. Well, I think that the memo we received from John Holler at DRM goes through California, Massachusetts, Oregon, Colorado, Washington, Nevada. Oh, and the, and and the enacting legislation. And it explains as well, so. how yeah. um, they got um, oh, yeah. priority. I haven't um, read all those bills. <laughs> have you? I've read some of them, yeah. <laughs> of course you have. <laughs> um, well, it was easy. You could click on the link. I know. It's all right there for you. Thank you, John Holman. So they, yeah, so there's definitely, they've all had some type of priority. You know, um, the issue is more like how, how they've done the rollout before the whole new system is, is, is up and running. Yeah, so. yeah I, I guess I keep hearing us talk about what might be accepted and so forth. I think what we need to talk about is what is the difference really? You know, you're talking about distribution, you're talking about the, the person purchaser. You know, how many things are there really different that we have to deal with when we look at what needs to be changed right. in the current format versus going in, going down every one of the things that's there currently? What is the really that we have to deal with? And I think it's really supply. It's the person that's going to purchase it and what site you want to set, sell it at by the sound. Right. And I've started a list, and I'm sorry I didn't, I was uh, down in human trafficking. Uh, right before I came up here, so I didn't have time to go print off some new stuff. But um, it's like you've had a lovely morning. I know. <laughs> it's a little different. Right. Um, geez. Um, so, uh, so, but I have, you know, been keeping kind of a, a running list of things. So, like some of the things that were in 196 are like 
you know, for purposes of adult sales, you can only sell X amount. So you determine that, right, which would be separate and apart from what dispensaries can do for patients. They can sell up to two ounces to a patient per month. Um, and so you would just make the distinctions there. And I, I, I agree with you as I think, you know, it's possible to quantify a list there of, of what you would do and say, for purpose of adult sales, here's how it's different. Other than that, in terms of the regulatory structure, um, a lot of it is going to be able to be just the same. Yeah, I'm just trying to think of a quicker way to get through that versus of doing every single item on the list. Just if we had a list like you talked about right. working at, then we could look at those, make a judgment call, mm -hmm. and, and move on to the next. Right. Any questions for Michelle on this? So I feel like we're zeroing in on the basic structure that we uh, that we want to see in. So you would like to see a proposal for early sales? I believe that's the, the Willard Committee. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then and I'll include as part of that the list of what I would what I would think would be mm -hmm. the natural uh, kind of exemptions, and I would encourage. Um, uh, dispensaries and um, and DPS to send me any suggestions for what you think would be uh, tweaks that would need to be addressed um, with regard to, to the applicable statutory provisions and, and rules yeah. um, that were adopted pursuant to Chapter 86, um, so that, that that could that could work. Mm -hmm. well. No limit on the secondary growth so. At this point. We, we, can, we can certainly talk about that. Yeah. Here's the question. No limit on the secondary growing facility. I mean, I would think, and I, I don't know, but I think, you know, that's one of those those things that, you know, where even people who work really, you know, like the board is going to have to try to figure out how many tiers based on canopy size, how much do we want people to grow, and that's such a Every, it, it's kind of a shot, you know, everybody's just trying for a target to figure out what's the right amount from a supply, you know, and demand side, and you've heard from a lot of witnesses, you know, lots of times jurisdictions start out and there's a lack of supply, and then there's an oversupply, and they're always trying to go back and forth. They think with regard, if you only have five selling early, um, you know, they're gonna probably gear up as best they can to meet demand. They're not gonna. They're gonna be careful about overgrowing because they're not gonna be one of left with stuff that they can't sell. I don't know necessarily that you have to come up with some type of cap when you've only got four. I mean, five places that might possibly be doing it. Um, but that's just my sense of it. About uh, you. Do, you don't want to. Right. You don't want to strangle a market. Right. Nelson. Yeah, I, yeah, and I think we have to keep coming back to the fact that this is a temporary license, and then the rule rate will be made and stuff. So we, we don't need to overthink some of the things that we we know that's going to have to be made in rulemaking, you know, and caps and suppliers. We, we just I think the dispensary. I know one of my businesses is going to get a lot more room to grow, and. Uh, I think they're going to ramp up and, like any business, they want a customer. So one of the things that y'all had talked about was trying to figure out whether or not uh, any any anybody in the new system might be able to participate in the early sales. And it's tricky because, again, you know, we, we know how long it takes to get the rules up and everything, and the reason why it would work for dispensaries is because they're already regulated, right? And so. Once I build out the timeline based on what you guys decided last night and look at it and how the permits would run and when you'd have, see the first non-dispensary early sales and stuff, it's possible, uh, I won't make any promises here, but I will keep in mind that that's something that people have an interest in is looking at under the board when they start to issue licenses for small cultivators, since they're the first ones out of the gate, Right? So the way that you do the rolling applications is whether or not you could, if you want me to, see whether or not once they've got product, whether you would let them start selling to dispensaries that are doing early sales prior to the newly licensed retail stores up and running. 
Does that make sense? So they wouldn't have. So that if there's a lag time. Right. So they wouldn't have a ton of time, right? But they might be able to get a few extra more months in there or whatever, depending on how the it all worked out. But I'd have to look at that. And, and that's really, I, I feel like, the best I can do in terms of trying to figure out how to bring in small cultivators because I, I, I you know you heard from O'Grady I just think it's I just don't think you should go down the route of trying to combine the hemp program with the with the cannabis cultivation I think you have to regulate them you you know you're going to run into all sorts of problems if you don't have proper regulation even for small cultivators you want to make sure that um, you know that the product is safe you want to make sure there's appropriate security measures, and you want to have some traceability. Those are those are key things that I think you jeopardize the, the legitimacy of any regulated program if you if you don't if you don't regulate them properly. And so I think you would just have to have bring them in, have them be first out of the gate, and then they and then see if you can have them. You know, you don't require the dispensaries. You know, but you'd say that they can then be. You know, because maybe the dispensaries can't keep up with the demand, frankly, right? And so small cultivators that are starting to grow under the new system could sell to dispensaries until the new retailers are up and licensed. Well, let's see how that fits in the new timeline. Um, and, you know, we'll take a better look at that on Tuesday when we see a fresh, a fresh draft. Are there any other issues that you need our feedback or decision points on? Uh, Jim has decided that he's going to step back from his request on um, on a language change. Uh, we have already talked about a prevention fund and dedicating um, funds right. to that. We can so tweak where, that. What some. are you guys going to do that? Because I, I had spoken with Katie McClin and then also Nolan. Uh, Lamo at JFO is the is the fiscal person on this, and so what I would suggest, I told them kind of what you were interested. That we took a look at the language that came out of Senate Health and Welfare before it was stripped on the floor by probes, and I think that that language in 146 that it originated is too narrow for what you're talking about because it's only related to like prescription drugs and opiates and and things, and you guys are talking about more of like a broader approach to funds going for prevention of substance misuse. And so I just let them know that and that that I that you have the concept of you'd like to do some dedicated funds, but you're not really sure where to put them and how that you know the scope of it. And so I would suggest that maybe you have the two of them in and um, and that could be a discussion that you have um, with, with them to kind of focus on what you would do and then they can just let me know and I can you know work on the language and, and drop it in. Okay. Kelly, can you send an email to Katie and Nolan and see if they can join us before noon? On the off chance, <laughs> not crammed in committee. Uh, it'll be a fun opportunity because I used to spend a lot of time with those two in my healthcare days, but I haven't seen them much this year. So. So also just, I was wondering about what you're thinking in terms of piecing for next week because I um, I can see that, uh, you know, like Tuesday, you're going to want me to come back with the draft and go through it all day. House Human Services booked me at one, you know, at like one on Tuesday to start walking them through their <coughs> and so um, I just want to, you know, I want to certainly prioritize you guys getting your work done, but it's also, I know you need other committees to be able to get back to you on that. So if you can just let me know how you want me to handle some of that and, and juggle it. And um, I think it would be really helpful if you could spend that time with the Human Services Committee, because that's a okay. pretty <laughs> critical, um, uh, you know, we need a stamp of approval on the dispensary uh, changes. Right. And they may want to make some tweaks and suggestions. Um, so let's work with you in the morning, starting to go through the draft. Um, as soon as we get done with floor and caucuses, if we get done with floor and caucuses, tobacco. <laughs> oh, tobacco. Okay, so floor might be long. Not a problem then. Just, just a few questions. <laughs> I own that one. <laughs> uh, duly noted. 
Um, okay, well, that's going to be a, a tough time schedule for us to, to get any time um, to walk right. through the bill. We do, uh, we will have a, a memo back from Commerce. Uh, so we can spend some time going through that and maybe ask um, the chair to come up and spend some time with us if we have questions. Um, I doubt if we will hear from judiciary before midday on Tuesday. Do you? I, I do not know. I have not heard Yeah, I don't, I don't think so. I think that one's going to be a little more challenging than that. Uh, question? No, I, last night we... You know, I mentioned co-ops, and I want to just throw out on the table what I've been thinking about in terms of transition from the dispensary to the private commercial, <coughs> and that maybe we could consider under the same regulations and the whole scheme, allowing the existing dispensaries to contract with two or three small growers under their license umbrella um, as a means to reach the transition from one to the other. Mm. Not for discussion necessarily, just to be out on the table. Uh, I'm sorry. I, my head was going elsewhere. What? What? You, you're looking at me. No, I'm just mm. looking. Oh. Um, so the the cooperative model, I will admit, I don't I'm I don't know much about that. Uh, so in well, terms of how that's pardon? I don't know the co-op model is what I was necessarily considering. It's more like a sub. I'm sorry. Sub employment sort of thing, contracting. Independent right. contractors. Well, independent <laughs> under the under the uh, umbrella of their so existing I, license. I think what I heard Michelle say before, and Michelle, correct me if I didn't get this correctly, but I think what Michelle was suggesting before is that she's going to look at the timeline for how quickly that sort of an arrangement could be made, but that it is problematic to contemplate those small cultivators coming into the supply chain before the board has had a chance to, to do their uh, their rules. Yeah, I agree, and that's sort of why I say come under the umbrella of the existing structure of the license that the five people hold. I'm less concerned about it now that we have probably the option of an uncontrolled second facility, or an unlimited second facility, but that could always change. And I also saw it as a means to drag I, small producers from the I too find there to be a lot of benefit to trying to figure out a way to get the small growers in, but I'm not sure that we have, um, I'm not sure we've found the magic recipe on that yet, or timeline. Jim, did you have something? I know there's some pushback from some of my colleagues, but I still would like to, before we kick the bill out, like to consider going up a little bit on the excise tax um, and then let Ways and Means do what they do. Um, we're already dealing with appropriations issue on, so I, and appropriations may have a different viewpoint. So I just, I have to say my piece. So you, you're, you're bumping the excise as opposed to the hybrid yeah, 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 local yes. option? Yeah, I just, I, Unless someone can show me some what other states are doing on that, I think that does complicate things a little bit. I am concerned about if there's no skin in the game, no benefit for a locality, they might take a dim view. But until we actually see that, you know, maybe something we have to come back and visit later on. But um, I am talking about the general excise tax to 16, but maybe bumping it to 18. I want to make sure we have enough money for the education and prevention efforts that we've talked about. And I also want to make sure we have enough money for enforcement and also the regulatory structure. Um, and I, I know that's going to be under microscope as it goes through the other committees, but I want to start just a tad higher than where we are right now. So that's just me. Well, that's an easy change. It's not that it doesn't change the general architecture mm -hmm. of the bill. No. So. 
and we can certainly mull that over as we're searching for Easter eggs over the weekend. Are there any discussion, Marcia? I was wondering if anyone has had a chance to look at the rights of the individual retail establishments to advertise. Do we know what is in law, if anything, that allows them? Currently, dispensaries are prohibited from right. From advertising, but I think I let you know. I think that's highly suspect, and I think that's just if any, an agreement that they would challenge it. But. So it would be suspect because because I think that there's the, they still have some First Amendment rights there with regard to. Well, that's what I was speech. wondering. Yeah. Has anyone so I think, so I checked think a into that? Ban, um, is suspect. So. Uh, you know, I think it's more around the, the types of regu regulatory kind of buffers on it, like you guys have discussed, and the prior approval, like what John had proposed, which I'll include in the next draft, which is um, having a process for prior approval of advertising, um, having the provisions that are in there now around can't be false, deceptive, you know, focused on, you know, being particularly appealing to the under 21 set. Um, one of the things you talked about was whether or not uh, you should restrict it to point of sale only. Yes. I think um, I think you get pretty far along towards that by having the language that you have in there now, which is that they can't do any like flyers or outdoor advertising or anything unless they can prove that uh, no more than 30% of people who may be viewing it are um, are under 21. So I think. You, yeah, that's going to really kind of prohibit most outdoor advertising, things like that. So, um, and then you also have provisions in there for the board to be adopting rules on advertising, marketing, and signage as well. So I think you'll see an evolution of that. You know, we can kind of see what some other states have. Um, um, I think I was one of the things in looking at uh, some states, some, some language that John sent me in other medical programs. I think I added in some language around that you can't be offering prizes or awards. <coughs> You know, that, that sort of thing. Yeah. Right. Mm -hmm. So, um, <coughs> a, um, you know, a, 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 yeah. Can you tell me um, how we would measure whether or not 30% of the audience is expected to be under 21? Um, I cannot. I think you would have to. It would, you'd have to. Um, they would be probably rulemaking, looking at what criteria they would use to ascertain that, and then it would be up to the probably uh, up to the applicant to show that somehow whatever their proposal of where they're going to be showing it. And you know, like I talked about, like if it, you know, if you're doing an advertisement in a in a, in a bar or something like that where you have to be carded to even go into the facility then you know it'd be fine but if you're you know if you're doing outdoor advertising it's probably unlikely you can meet that requirement at least California and Colorado use a percentage like we do um, as far as viewer viewership for people 21 or older. I, I, I don't know how that works fact that at least the other states have used I, I'll say I didn't make it up. I got it from somewhere. <laughs> so somebody's doing it. Somebody's proposed it or somebody's figured it out besides me. All right. So I have word that um, Katie and Glenn will be able to come momentarily. Um, I'm hoping that we can still track down Nolan um, uh, so that we can give them whatever information they need to <coughs> to help draft something for us to look at. Any other um, points that you need uh, some feedback from us on? Um, I don't think so. 
I think I just got a lot to do. <laughs> um, you sleep last night. Start your homework? I am. Yeah, good That's idea. Right? Yes. Here, and then we can just coordinate. Um, and uh, uh, and I don't think you actually need to know much about all of this, other than the fact that what they're, you know, what I sent you last night, which is that they're considering um, whether or not they want to right now the revenue that would be coming from the the tax of the 16% excise re retail tax on um, cannabis and cannabis products that would probably be probably seeing in like FY22 is that um, whether or not right now it's all going to the general fund and whether or not they want to dedicate a certain percentage or a certain amount of money from that revenue going into some type of existing fund or a new special fund that would be dedicated not to just like what the one was originally in 148 but something broader around substance about misuse prevention. So. Jim? I don't know if you want to talk about it now, if you want to talk about it Tuesday, but um, I don't know if we resolved the board makeup issue. Um, I had suggested in trying to find a middle ground with the administration. Maybe we have three gubernatorial appointees. Uh, there was some pushback on that. Um, the representative from Putney threw out two. Um, and I just didn't know if that was something we needed to conclude and give to Michelle or if that's something we want to talk about next week. I think we can talk about that next week. It's not okay. a huge um, drafting Change. lift. Okay. Um, that's fine. We can talk about that sure. and, and uh, All right. thank you. Look at the new draft and happy to have that conversation. All right. Great. Thank you, Thanks. Michelle. Sure. And I'll just be downstairs so if you guys need me or have a question, please can So, Katie, thanks for coming again. Try to find an excuse to see everybody in Legislative Council <laughs> at least once during the year. <laughs> so just to, just to get you up to speed, kind of where we are, we, um, we had the Commissioner of Health in. Um, and in the context of that conversation, we understand that what the commissioner envisions is kind of this Iceland model of, you know, uh, a broad set of prevention investments. Um, uh, and so what we are concerned with is, um, is sending a clear statement in this bill, even though we know that revenue is not going to be coming for a couple of years, but sending a clear statement in this bill that we would like to see a portion of the revenue from uh, cannabis retail sales be dedicated to those prevention activities. And he's talking about setting up, um, you know, robust regional um, coalitions that, that um, can fund a different type of prevention effort in different parts of the state. And so, um, what we needed to talk to you about is where would that money logically go? Are we going to need to set up a special fund? Is there already a fund that exists? And uh, if you can give us some guidance on that. Sure. Uh, Katie McLean, Office of Legislative Council, for the record. And I know that Nolan was also um, notified that you're taking testimony on that. So he's kind of my counterpart on the money piece here. Um, so what I can tell you is that the Senate has been looking at S-146 and the version that left um, Senate Health and Welfare did have intent language in it specifically around the use of taxes to fund, um, to fund prevention efforts and that specific language was, it is the intent of the General Assem Assembly to explore revenue generated by the taxation of substances such as cannabis, tobacco, tobacco substitutes, and alcohol for the purpose of funding substance misuse prevention initiatives throughout the state. So that was the language as passed Senate Health and Welfare. Uh, that did not make it out of Senate approve, so it's not in the bill that came over from the Senate. 
similarly, there was a 400,000 that was dedicated for prevention um, from the Evidence-Based Education and Advertising Fund, and that's specifically limited to the prevention of prescription um, drug misuse efforts, and that also is taken out of the bill and Senate appropriations. So the bill that you receive from the Senate um, doesn't have any money or any intent language attached to it. Um, in terms of um, a special fund, that was something that was considered downstairs in Senate Health and Welfare. I did draft versions creating a special fund. Ultimately, that committee decided not to move forward with the special fund, and the bill that you've received doesn't have any type of dedicated funding stream for prevention. Well, happy news. So you've drafted something before. I have. Okay. <laughs> Um, and and it fairly closely tracks to what we're talking about in concept here. Yeah, um, so in terms of setting up a special fund, I would probably organize it by um, putting it in Title 18 in a chapter that we're creating that's specifically related to prevention. Um, it's not um, just focused on prevention of cannabis use, but the misuse of all substances. Um, so I could I could similarly set up that and you um, need to dedicate a, a certain amount of funds or percentage of funds from a certain funding stream mm -hmm. that would go into that fund. So I'm trying to think, um, there are conversations, you know, the first, you know, X amount or the X percentage that's generated from a specific tax would go into the fund, something like that. Um, so you would set the parameters and I just add it as a section mm -hmm. um, into that that new um, chapter. In terms of drafting, now that I'm kind of thinking this through as I'm talking to you, um, but because the chapter in S146 hasn't passed and won't pass by the time this bill is moving, um, we can't cross-reference a bill that hasn't passed yet. Mm -hmm. So it might make more sense to recommend your language that um, to be added next door in S146 so it's all part of um, one chapter. Um, I don't know how that works from your end, so we could talk about that more offline, how we want to um, do that. But we just should be aware that when there are two bills moving at the same time, we, um, it's very tricky to cross-reference one bill that hasn't passed yet and another bill. Right. Um, and because that bill didn't seem to be moving in timeline that matches what we're doing that's why we had uh, contemplated creating the fund in mm -hmm. this bill um, and allowing them to do some of the more detailed work around what what how the funds are distributed and where the you know where the priorities are and how you how you create a prevention program and wow. It may be semantics, but we seem to all of a sudden be talking about this in a context only of prevention, and education is something that I think is a completely different word and concept, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. and I'd like to make sure that the two are melded when we talk about money. Right. right. Yeah, just reference Bill across the wall, which I think is dealing with They finished their work on it, but I know they have been. Well, when it comes to identifying a fund, uh, a good point. Mm -hmm. Any other questions for Katie? So we need you and Nolan to huddle with Michelle over the weekend and try to figure okay. out how to create us a fund, even okay, even in the absence of S one forty six. Okay, sure. Um, and to the extent you can provide some specific parameters around what you're looking for, um, that would be helpful in setting it up, up who would manage the fund, mm -hmm. um, the amount that's dedicated to the funding stream, um, mm -hmm. that type of information. Yep. But yes, we can do that. Excellent. Okay. Thank you. You're welcome. Committee discussion? Well, after all that hard work last night, it looks like we're uh, cruising into 
to an earlier day. Thumbs up. All right. Anybody else that we need to hear from? I don't think so. <clears throat> Not now. I mean, that was a good discussion on setting up the, the fund. Mm -hmm. yep. We've already talked about the amount of money, or at least we had a discussion. <laughs> yes. So are we talking a floor, a percentage, and a ceiling? <laughs> so are we going to get that, that yeah, refined no, with it? <laughs> my preference would be to make sure we send a clear message that there is funding. And it's going to be paid by the excise tax, but it, it starts with funding, not waiting the end of the year and see if we sell anything. So I, 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 that's where I'm coming from. I want a clear message. Whether it's a million, million and a half, I just think we ought to make it clear that we do something. I like the yeah. percentage uh, that you had outlined yesterday, 30 percent is fine with me. Mm -hmm. At, on the cap, um, personally, um, I'm afraid of, of setting up an incentive for us to <laughs> raise, but I am, um, you know, raise money, hopefully sell more because we're going to get more. But I also understand the dynamic that if we're selling more, maybe we need more. I, I, I'm, I, I will leave that for others. That's, that's all. Not a point of advocacy, just a kind of a question. Is there anybody that has done this that has set the ceiling for a tax and then allowed the board to adjust it based upon market demand or anything uh, like that within a prescribed? Uh, I don't think that works. That's why I'm asking. But, but you can always come back to the legislature. Just because we set a percentage and a cap in this bill doesn't mean that a couple years or even uh, next year we can't change that. Okay. I, I don't think you can have an agency right. change that. Mm -hmm. That gets to be a, a legislative. Oh, is this Nolan? Excellent. Jump right in the seat, Nolan. <laughs> <laughs> oh, you were hoping you'd get off scot free without this. Okay, so we've talked to Katie. She says you are you are the special funds guru. <laughs> um, so welcome to our committee. It's nice to see you again. I haven't seen you across the table since we were down the hall of here together. I have never testified to this committee. <laughs> never. Well, it's our loss. Yes. <laughs> you will leave impressed. <laughs> I hope so. And one piece. <laughs> yes. Don't worry. We haven't well. chewed up anybody and spit them out yet today. That's because you haven't met me yet. <laughs> I'm tasty. That's <laughs> right. Okay. So as long as you tell, as long as you don't tell us that you can't create a special fund that we can dedicate um, cannabis revenues to for the purposes of um, prevention programs, uh, you won't be chewed up and spit out. Okay. Well, for the record, no one I will the Joint Fiscal Office. You could create any fund you want. <laughs> Just keep in mind that there's been a, um, a, a cognizant push or to sort of reduce the number of special funds that there are because we have a lot of special funds. And so, I mean, part of the whole reason by, um, you probably saw, I remember in budget adjustment, there's this thing called the State Health and Resources Fund, which is probably our biggest special fund. And that's for all the tobacco money, um, claims assessment, et cetera, goes into this fund. It's probably two of oh, the employer, uh, employer assessment, provider taxes. It probably had $350 million in it. And that was a fund that we used to draw a Medicaid match along with general fund. And there was that push to move that into the general fund to make the general fund look bigger, et cetera. So you probably remember this argument. So, um, but then, you know, all the different agencies use special funds. DFR has three special funds just for insurance. I learned this the other day. So I think the answer is you could create any fund you want. And just be mindful that. We are very mindful that we could, we could make it look really good and beautiful and then send it down the hall and it could yeah. come back looking very different. What, what we are trying to do here, though, is to send a very clear message that in the context of creating 
um, an adult use cannabis uh, market that we want a certain portion of those revenues to go in a dedicated place to fund uh, prevention activities. So uh, we would like to create a fund that that has that purpose. Um, our hope was that the committee across the hall would be moving S146, which does mm -hmm. does some of the work to, to set up that infrastructure. Um, since they may not get to it until next year, which is fine, um, we would like to at least now uh, create the fund and, and let them do the detail work. Is that fair? Yes, Rob. Um, why would we not? Would we be able to use that existing fund? And that it, well, one, I guess on the other end, a lot of that money was earmarked and used for prevention and education. And then backing up into it, um, it was kind of a special source. So the, that fund actually was more Medicaid specific. Health department has, uh, they've got the, the evidence based an education, I don't remember what it's called, but basically it's the, um, it's a tax on pharmacy. What is it, the claims? I can't remember. Anyway, it's a tax on pharmaceuticals. I don't know what it is. Half a percent, three quarters of a percent? It's a little, it's, yeah, and it raises a certain amount of money, but so at one point we thought about, in my head I was like, oh, we could put it in that fund, but then I realized we shouldn't because um, that money is specifically for like things that are related to pharmacy prevention, so like opioid or addiction, so or um, I'm trying to remember specifically what that fund does. So it's like well, maybe I wouldn't want to commingle those two because if we start commingling them, then the farmers, the manufacturers, fee, that's what it sorry, the manufacturer fee, uh, the manufacturers might balk because oh then we'd be using the money for something that's not related to um, addiction treatment specific to pharmaceuticals. So. Uh, you could maybe find another fund. We could talk to the health department, see if they've got... What was the fund that the tobacco settlement money went into? Tobacco settlement money went... Gosh, it's a good question. That was the one I was talking about. So oh, yeah. um, it was... I don't know where that went. I can find out. That, that was the one I was alluding to. That Sorry. If you could put the money in that Sorry. fund, um, it seems like that you've got most of the infrastructure already in place. You know, I can find out where that goes. That might just go into the health fund. I'm not sure, but I'll find out. Uh, that's a good question. That's a very good question. Do you remember? I should know this, but I didn't do the bill. How much was the manufacturer fee? Or how much was the with the cannabis? Oh, 16% is what we're looking at right now. Is there an estimate on that? Yes, yes. they're wildly. I'm JFO notes. asking you for a fiscal note. Yes. <laughs> <laughs> and my friend John here has the fiscal note at his fingertips. But I didn't work so on it, so that's why. Wasn't the mid range 6 million, give or take? Well, one year is out of prevention. In year one, the, the excise revenue would be the low ball estimate is 3.8 million, um, high estimate is 7.4. Okay. Um, and how much are you dedicating to prevention versus? So there's going to need to be some refinement of this, I think, because when we. Um, when we go through the bill and look at all the pieces put together, we're going to recognize that some portion of the first year revenues need to go to backfill the expense of standing up the board. So the board's going to exist for two years before we have revenue. Um, so some of that's going to have to be backfilled there. But then the suggestion was that we put a minimum of one point, what did you say, Jim? Minimum of 1.4? I, I threw out 1.5. Um, okay, minimum of 1.5, um, and up to six million dollars. So, what I say to that is that we have lots of individual special funds that have a lot less than that. So, if you were to create a special fund that's over a million dollars, it wouldn't be inconceivable. Um, you could also create the special fund and then let the money committee decide. Like, is that more appropriate, or you yeah, know, or or even the administration, the health department might have some suggestions about funds that are similar, but you can just yeah. create a lot of TV so I shouldn't say this, but you could create a special fund with the intent, or have some kind of intent about special fund, and then they would understand what it is you're trying to do, 
Yeah. And try I mean, to I don't think we need to get it perfect because we exactly. know that it's going to be changed mm -hmm. in the money phase. So uh, yeah, I agree. what we want to do is is make a clear statement that we're dedicating resources yes. to prevention. So you could do a tent language where you could just do it. I can't tell you what to do. Let's create a fund. Okay. Got to give it a cool name though. <laughs> with, a, with an acronym? <laughs> oh yeah. Okay. <laughs> That's your homework this weekend, people. Or email, it, email it to Nolan since he'll be creating the fund over the weekend. Okay. And, and it, Look, Jim's writing down his homework assignment. <laughs> I think he's going to come up with the best one, right? No doubt. <laughs> I just don't want to kill you. I just, you know, since I got the camera on me, I don't want to go back to my office. Like, you told him to create another special fund. <laughs> You're fired. <laughs> Well, I think we told you we wanted to create another special fund. Well, we did. That's what I heard. Boy, I miss testifying in front of the new committees. This is fun. <laughs> <laughs> what else do you want to know? <laughs> How else can I help you? Committee, anything else you want to ask of uh, the healthcare and human services JFO analyst? All right. All right. Happy Friday. Happy Friday. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Nolan. Next time I'll knock first. <laughs> wow. No, I can see your profile. I knew that was you. It was me. Yeah. From my gate. I can see. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you, Nolan. No uh, so, committee, let's uh, let's break now. Um, drive safely. Tomorrow's going to be a rainy day, so remember your umbrella. Remember, turn around, don't drown. Before we go, yeah. I think yeah. I should make note of what happened with basketball this morning. Uh -oh. oh, and what was that? Uh -oh.